Hey guys, welcome to Appalachia's Homestead. Patera with you today. We have a fun video for you. I get a lot of questions about our chickens and our barn, particularly a lot of folks want to learn about broody hens and baby chicks. They're starting their homesteads and they have a lot of questions. So I was talking online with Miss Esther from Falchomatic. If you have not been to that YouTube channel yet, you need to go. I'm going to put the link in the description below. You're going to love them, okay? We're talking off-grid at its finest, and they are doing some fabulous things on their channel, and you're just going to love her. She's just so soothing and wonderful and so enthusiastic and just so motivational, and you're going to really love their channel. But we were talking, and she has sent me some questions, okay? So instead of me writing, 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 I said, well, you know, I could make a video about this if you would like, you know, take your questions and I can give examples and show you. It's easier, I'm a talker, and it's easier for me to just tell you than to have to explain and go back and forth. And she was like, yes. So that's what we're going to do. So I have got some specific questions from her, which I think is going to benefit a lot of you as well. And it's also talking about or going with the route that we're going with on our homestead, uh, which is in the off-grid movement. So this is going to combine all of these things. It's going to help many of you out there, I think. And also, I know it's going to be wonderful because we're going to get a lot of discussions going in the comments below. This Stuff like this is really great for the homesteading community because it pulls in a lot of different experiences. And that's what this is based upon. So, Esther. She sent me some specific questions, so I've literally written them out, and I'm going to address them, add a little bit to them, and we're going to go forth. Okay, because they are off-grid, or if you want to be off-grid, or if you are trying to move in off-grid movement in terms of your reliancy on your food sources, being able to procure your own food on your own farm and land is key. We know this, okay? I try very hard to keep, or we are moving with the direction of being able to well, let's put it out there. Our, our animals are making babies, okay? That is off-grid to me. That is self-reliant. But when I say off-grid, what do I mean by that? That means I'm trying to let them do it naturally. There's a lot of things that come with this. So while I do incubate eggs and all of this sort of stuff, I love all of that. At the same time, we have a lot of broody mamas from time to time. And there, I think there's certain reasons why we do, so we're going to address that. She wanted to know specifically... What do I recommend in terms of my experience alone? So there's a lot of different experiences and opinions out there, but what have we had the best luck with in terms of breeds for broody mamas and for mothers that have been really good at raising their own chicks? Particularly, obviously, we're talking about chickens. Here are my top three, okay? My top three have been Buff Orpingtons. We've talked about this a lot before. Wellsomers. Pretty good and also Black Copper Morans. Now, in terms of giving her specific advice, I'm gonna recommend two breeds for her because of where she lives, off-grid, very cold climate. Buff Orpingtons are gonna work out really well for her for many different reasons. Wellsomers would work out for obvious, uh, in, for their climate in particular, okay? They're very cold hardy. I have noted that the Buffs and Buff Orpingtons, the Buffs, and the Wellsomers overall, in my personal opinion, if I had to narrow it down, are the ones I'm going to go with. Now, she particularly is interested in Buff Orpingtons. In fact, they kind of have their heart and mind set on that. <laughs> Who doesn't, okay? We've gone over this in several videos before. For sustainability, for many different reasons, p folks really enjoy the Buff Orpingtons. You have a dual-purpose breed. You're going to get lots of great eggs from these gals, okay? Not only that, they're very, very healthy, so that's why they're known to be really good meat birds as well. So if you're going to have the best of both worlds in that regards, Buff Orpingtons are great. They're not super flighty. They're overall that we have found the Orpingtons, whether it even be the, even, uh, the Lavenders, have been wonderful around children. You need to know that. If you've got small children or kids on the farm, you want something that's probably a little bit easy going. That's going to be great for her. Also... They're excellent broody mamas. I mean, they go broody. They have here. Now, I do think the environment that we provide for them helps. We'll go over that in a minute. But they do tend to go broody overall the most. And they do a great job with raising their babies. We've got that on film. Lots of videos on that. You've seen it live for your own self. Um, they're really good at raising their own 
baby chicks. Now, when they get to the 30, 40 day mark, they're ready for their babies to be independent, which isn't a bad thing. I think that's a good thing also, so they get back to laying the eggs that you want. So we're definitely recommending the, the Buff Orpingtons for her if you're going to gear it to one breed. So that's what I'm gonna to recommend to her and to you as well out there if you're really interested in this topic. Um, now what she wants to know is, I'm looking at my paper because I'm, I'm making sure I'm answering all the questions. What advice do I have in terms of broody, you know, having broody hens, creating an environment of broodiness, all of the above. We've had a lot of broody hens, okay? This seems to be something that I think has happened to us for multiple reasons. We've created a large barn and a nurturing area for our for our animals and also for our chickens in particular. They have a lot of room, okay? Even if you're only going with 8, 12, 15, a small flock of hens, you still have to make sure they've got a lot of space, okay? Uh, you want to make sure that that is important for them. Um, you also want to make sure that when you have a, a potential of wanting to create a good environment for broodiness, once they go broody, I am a true believer that it's very wise for you to separate them, if possible, to a separate broody area, okay? We have done that several different ways. We have tried dog cages, worked out pretty well. I have a separate small coop in my barn. That worked well. What has worked best for us, however, is to make sure that when we sensed that we had a broody, uh, we got her into what I call a broody stall. So what Esther is doing is they are not, they're not getting rid of the whole notion of their coop, but they're wanting to create an area for multiple animals and to create an environment for broodiness, okay? They're wanting to be self-reliant, okay, self-sustainable. I think that in whatever you're building, even if you have a chicken coop, um, but if it's in an area where other animals are, a small shed or barn or whatever, um, I think having a separate, almost like a stalled area, this is not expensive to create. We did it with tea steaks, chicken wire, and tea steaks. I found that putting them in the dog crate in a small area kind of made them feel claustrophobic. The whole goal is for them to feel comfortable and nurtured and not caged in, okay? You don't want them to feel panicked and stressed because they will come off their eggs. They could break their eggs. They will fight to be free when they want to come off and get their moments of peace. You know, they're going to come off the eggs a couple of times a day. One, maybe two. They're going to want to come out and stretch and maybe dust bathe and eat and drink and give you a nice broody poop and all of that. If they feel caged, it creates stress in that environment. That's been my experience. When we were able to take a stalled area, nothing fancy, and it made her feel like she had her larger space to do what she needed to do, the stress was gone. Not only that, when you have created this separate, that it's, she can, you know, there's this wire there, so she still feels like she's part of the flock, but she has her separation. Nothing's getting in there to compete with the nesting box and to get on the eggs, that creates stress because they will compete for nesting boxes. Some broodies are more fierce than others. I had an Easter egger. Nobody's touching that clutch of hers, okay? Nobody. But the Welsomer, I had to create this broody stall for her because even though she has been an excellent broody mama and a mother hen even after, she was pushed around by some of the hens. That's why we created a whole separate area. So you do need to keep in mind that if the goal is to have broody mamas with, you know, with babies being created for you, you have to create this environment for them. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to work. It, you know, put them in a box and they do their thing. That happens all the time. I'm just telling you the odds are more in your favor if you can go this route. Now, in terms of nesting boxes, some hens will go broody just somewhere in the corner of the barn. It's the wildest thing you've ever seen in your life. That has happened for me multiple occasions. Let me tell you what we do, and it works every single time. 
There are different styles of nesting boxes that folks like to use. Some folks will use baskets and cute little crates and the plastic shopping crates and whatnot. We have some of that going on in our barn. It's something we've been able to recycle or reuse. And for the, for the whole point of just laying eggs every day, no problem. Broodiness is a whole separate beast. This is what I'm going to recommend for you. I recommend this number one is your nesting box to go to anyway, because why spend the money if you're going to on something that you're going to change anyway? Trust me on this. I go to Lowe's or Walmart. Now, when they're on sale for $3.49 or $4 right around Christmas or, you know, spring cleaning time or whatever, that's a good time to grab them. I bought this just yesterday at, our, at a Lowe's, uh, the closest to our house, because I need to create another uh, nesting box. It was $5 and change. This is an 18 gallon tote. This is not fancy, folks. It's 18 gallons, not the 30, the 18 gallon tote. Now you can get them in multiple colors. You can get them clear. I would recommend you get the darkest color possible. Dark blue, dark gray. You know, I don't know about black per se, that might get a little hot in the summer, but dark is good and let me tell you why. Because you're gonna cut out a, a space here I'm gonna show you in a minute. This is big enough for my largest hens. Okay, my largest hens are my buffs and my black Australorps. Plenty of space in here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut out a spot right here, your three folded sheet of paper, which is about an eight by eight spot. We're gonna cut it out right here. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna cut out, I'll draw out the area. We're gonna take the X-Acto knife. My husband or I will cut it out. Nesting box. Why is this, it, you look at this and you go, well, that's not fancy, that's not cute, that doesn't have curtains. No, it doesn't, but let me tell you why it works. Number one, hard plastic. When you need to clean these, they are very effective in being able to transport out of your area for cleaning. Chickens love clean, fresh environments. Broody mamas and broody hens, they love that. So. We have created what we call nesting box condos. They love these things. So they're very mobile, so we can have it for that. We can also clean them. The lids come off with ease for cleaning. Also, not only that, these broody hens, when they go broody, they love a private, warm, clean, cozy, dark area. If they're wide out in the open and things are pecking at them or things can get in and all this stuff, it doesn't seem to work out real well in most cases from what we can see. I highly recommend that if you are trying to encourage a broody environment, this would be the route that I go. We'll, we've got some videos on this too, so, um, but this has worked out best for us. Now, the next question she's got um, is asking just general tips on mixing farm animals. Obviously we mix most of our farm animals. Now my ducks I have chosen to keep separate. I have certain breeds of chickens, specialty breeds, separate um, because we're breeding them and we also have our silkies separate. But my, most of my chickens, my Great Pyrenees, my cow, my goats, they are all together. However, you need to be aware that there's a certain dynamic in a barn that can create problems if you're not keeping an eye on it and that is called a rooster. Now, I love roosters. We have lots of roosters on our farm, and I recommend uh, if you're wanting to have fertilized eggs and to be self-sustainable and have broody hens with fertilized eggs, if you can have a rooster, as Esther is going to be getting, then obviously, you know, you need a rooster. But understand there are certain dynamics. I don't know particularly why certain things are the way they are. I've noticed that when my goat is indoor, one of my goats is indoors in bad weather, she tends to get stressed when roosters are trying to tread and mate with hens. She does not like that. The same with my great Pyrenees. He wants to protect the hens from the roosters. He doesn't necessarily attack anything, but I do want to say that when you add a rooster to your farm, it can add a certain dynamic. So you need to keep an eye on that. Esther does not have a rooster at this time, so she's asking about that. So I just want to throw that out there. Overall, I think it's going to work great, but keep a mindful eye of the behaviors of larger animals with hens and with particularly roosters, okay? Just want to throw that out there. That's why we rotate a lot. We do a lot of barn checks and we watch. 
Now, in terms of a rooster, if she is interested, obviously, with buff Orpingtons, um, I'm going to recommend, a, obviously, a buff Orpington rooster to her. I've talked about that before. I have lavender Orpingtons. Awesome roosters. Never had a tr We've never had any issue with any of them at any point. My best buddy uh, in terms of homesteading, Miss Homestead Lady, number one recommended rooster in you know 35 years or so of homesteading. She said, I'm telling you, I've had they've they've had all kinds of things, okay? And every time they're coming back to the Buff Orpington rooster. And her number one reasoning is because he's very um, gentle with his girls. But not only that, he's great with the kids. Now, in terms of ratio, I'm going to recommend if you've got one rooster, your best ratio of hens is 10 to 12. And even with that, he's probably going to pick a couple that he likes a little bit better than the others, okay? So, be mindful of watching, you know, their backs and all of that sort of thing. So, again, creating a very nurtured, warm, clean environment. These types of nesting boxes, I'm telling you, they're the trick. You can keep them clean easier. If you have a hen that goes broody somewhere, example, we had a hen that went, we had two hens that went broody in our loft. We had five broody hens at one time. That's no joke. And two of them went broody up in our loft. One was literally just in the corner, like on a little, she created a little nest and she went broody and then another one was on some black plastic. When I added these upstairs and helped move them to it, that's where they remained, okay? So another good thing about having these is once you create your opening, if you need to just transport her, say she's broody and she's been in there broody for 14 days and you wanna move her to the broody stall when it gets dark, we just kinda of covered this area with a, a little uh, over the top and we just gently transported her to the no, new area. It's like she didn't even know it happened. She was so in love with her broody area. I hope this helped you out. I'm so excited to have gotten these questions and to be able to help fellow homesteaders. And again, go check out uh, Fouchomatic. We're gonna put that link down below. And we just are just excited to, to be able to work with all of these fantastic homesteaders and well, YouTubers, and you guys love them too. So I think I covered everything. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for watching us here at Appalachia's Homestead. Be sure to like and subscribe and check us out on Facebook and Instagram and all of these cool places. And just keep homesteading, and we'll talk to you soon.